Hey there, it's Sam Stein, managing editor at the Bulwark, and I am joined now by the great A.B. Stoddard, who is a writer for the Bulwark. We're going to be talking about her incredible piece this morning. Uh, I want to make sure I have the headline correctly because you have to do it justice. It is Trump just had his worst week ever. Ever. Ever? Are we sure? Ever, A.B.? Make the case why this is the worst week ever for Donald Trump. Okay, well, Sam, I can remember weeks in 2017, 18, 19, 20, when I thought, this is it, you know? <laughs> yes. But remember, we have to distinguish for Trump, right, between what bothers him and what bothers us. So we think when he meets with Sergei Lavrov, the foreign minister for the Russians in the Oval Office, and gives away classified information that he got from the Israelis, that that's the worst thing ever. It doesn't bother him. No. This is the worst week for Donald Trump ever. January 6th didn't bother him. Republican electeds fled in horror for what, all of nine days? For some, it was only three or four. Yeah. Um, the Access Hollywood week in early October 2016, I bring up in the piece, you could argue, was his worst week ever in politics. I don't even wait. And when you're a star, they let you do it. You can do anything. <laughs> Whatever you want. Grab him by the pussy. I can do anything. I don't think so because he didn't need to win. Now he's trying to stay out of prison and he needs to win. So it's different. And last week just was a hurricane of bad news for Trump, great news for Harris. The entire momentum shifted in the race. It's a completely new election. Doesn't mean she's going to win. Just a brand new campaign. And he is miserable. Well, that's what I, so it seems like the reason it's a bad week uh, is because of what the future has in store for him if he loses this election, right? The immunity issue, the ability to pardon himself, his legal liabilities, they all persist past the election. But a lot of it, almost all of it, could go away if he's elected. And so that's why this election is way more critical for him on a personal level than it was, say, in 2016 when he was a newbie on the scene, right? Oh, precisely. But he also just wants to win uh, this campaign because he pretends he won the last one. So he doesn't like to lose. And he was really, I think we need to, I think we need to remind people, these polls against Biden, where Trump was in the lead, date back to last July. This is not a brand new thing. Like he just got in the lead and he was feeling triumphant. He's right. been leading. This election was his to lose. And so- You know, and that's kind of crazy too. It's like, He's never actually been in a spot, right, where he's leading. Right. It's always been in every one, each of his runs. He's always trailed almost the entirety of the run. So he, the idea that he could lose that power uh, that he had become accustomed to, probably sitting back of his head, uh, weighing on him psychologically. Oh, it's killing him. He was finally <laughs> in a com- he was finally in a commanding position, and this election was in the bag. I mean, he. You know, let's look back to July 13th. He gets shot. He survives. He stands up in defiance, an iconic photo that will make history of the blood streaming down his face, his fist in the air. Everyone rallies. The nation is sympathetic. Uh, President Biden goes out not once, not twice, but three times to talk about how horrible it is, um, that there's no place for this type of violence. Uh, He rolls out 36 hours later to his convention where he's going to have the surprise of his vice presidential pick people at the convention celebrating the fact that he's going to unite the nation now because he's and he's the chosen one and he's i mean he's the dominant player in this drama there's no joe biden he's joe biden's going to lose trump is now a he thinks sort of right a figure of sympathy and he's triumphant the the entire convention goes well they run against joe biden they double down on MAGA. Uh, Vance is a big deal. Everything's great. It was beyond their imagination, Sam, that within days that J.D. Vance would become a joke, right. um, let alone that they would be running against somebody else. Yeah, it kind of all fell apart rather quickly, I guess. Uh, and then you have the added component of J.D. Vance. How much do you think he's kicking himself over that choice? I really, he, he does not like <laughs> To be second guess. It's not just that J.D. Vance is not a little bit bad. If it was a little bit bad, J.D. Vance would have some detractors and some critics, right? It's people saying, wow, this was a mistake on Trump's part. And he does not like to be second guessed like that. That doesn't happen to him. It hasn't really happened before. Um, he's fired good people, but he has not hired bad people and been stuck with them. So this is a this is really this is really tough um, and we know the. So you're, you're of the mindset that he's stuck with it. Cause, cause I think, uh, Bill uh, of, uh, is sort of leaning towards the idea that 
he might jettison Vance. I don't see that happening. I just that would be a, that would be a admission of error that I don't think Trump's capable of at this juncture. That's the way I feel. That he can't, yeah. he can't say I made a mistake and I'm and I'm backing out. Not only that, but the, it's not in his character to like succumb to the critics on the left who are memifying JD Vance, right? Like, and you saw it this week. I think this is my next question. He's like, how did how he how he and they are responding to what has been, I think, objectively a very bad week for them is that they're lashing out in, in almost feral form. What do you expect the campaign to do and Trump specifically to do? And I think he touched on it a little bit in this case is how he's responding to this. Uh, but what do you expect over the next couple of weeks? Well, he's flailing. I mean, he, you know, he, he's really in a state of shock still, even though this was always the default track, right? That the Democrats would be on if Biden had right. out. So it's not like he's suddenly running against Gretchen Whitmer and he doesn't know what to do. Um, they, they should have been ready for this. They actually did some polling on this, but he's having some, like the third stage of grief right now. There's a lot of anger mm-hmm. and shock and He's still talking about Joe Biden on the stump. He's going to go after on immigration. You've heard a lot of that. The party's trying to do that. Um, he's going to go after her from um, the left, um, saying that she was soft on death penalty. He's going to go after her from the right, targeting African-American men online, saying that she was ready to lock up anyone for anything. What you see, though, right now is just emotionally, he's so freaked. He's saying he can't stay on a consistent message. He's just saying she's sick. She's a bomb. Well, everyone, every, nobody liked her a week ago. Now she's so magnificent. Um, she's she's evil and she doesn't like Jewish people. And of course, she's married to a Jewish man. So yeah, she's it's, got it's, Doug. It's irrational. It's irrational. She's got Doug. Uh, you know, Caputo uh, had an interesting observation about this in his piece about how it's scrambling things for Trump. He made the case that the reason that it's bothering him so much, or at least the people around him, is that Trump is a product not of politics, but of culture. And they look at it as politics kind of flows downstream from culture. And what's happened with Harris is not that she's had some meteoric political rise, which she has, right? Like raising $200 million is impressive, but it's that she's become sort of culturally accepted if it's not exalted in the past week and and all these people have like turned to her as a almost a quasi savior of the of the country and i think they find that to be um well they're irritated by that and i think they're also intimidated by that in, in a way i think they are intimidated sam that's a really good point she has tapped into a vein in the culture that is unavailable to donald trump he's made some really i mean really impressive moves um in into the Democratic coalition, right? The flight of non-college uh, black and non-college Latino men, particularly into the Republican Party is very, racial realignment is, I don't want to give him credit for that, but but he likes to think he of himself- He jumped on it and he's accelerated it for sure. He's, he, he thinks of his, himself as, as a TV star first, right? And, and right. a man of the culture, just like you said, and of Hollywood. And, and, and he loves star power and he loves a good show and he knows what looks great to the eye. And what what's you know what crackles so the whole I, that's why the whole idea of the Democratic convention is just really going to freak him out because because most of America won't watch it and they won't care they might hear about it because it's going to be really electrifying I think but it's right. really going to get to him because it's really well, important and it's going to gonna, it's gonna be a bigger audience than his and, but it's I mean, not only because it's got much more dramatic. Uh, inputs, right? It's got uh, the passing of the torch. It's got the Obamas. It's got the first black female candidate who's ever going to be nominated. It has the specter of Trump looming over everything. And so people are going to watch it. I think there are going to be more people watching the Democratic convention than watch the Republican one, in part because the Republican one, it felt at that point, to your piece's point, like that was a foregone conclusion, that this was almost like a a valedictorian address that they had won this thing. And And now that's not the case. There's more drama now. I think there's a narrative, you know, there is a, a drama to a, a bigger story to the DNC, but I suspect it'll be very Hollywood. I think there'll be surprise appearances no, yeah. by people. And I think that it'll be a cultural event. And that will yes. be nuts. Well, listen, maybe <laughs> it's a great piece. Uh, the audience loves it. Thank Thanks you so for much. writing it. I'm looking forward to the next one, whatever it may be. <laughs> okay. Everyone, read, everyone tune into the Bulwark, read Amy's latest piece. And uh, check us back here on our YouTube channel. Please subscribe. We welcome all that. Amy, talk to you later. Thanks.